Hello everyone, today is Thursday, June 22nd, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So thank you so much. All right, what are we talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions, and I'm going to flesh that out in a lot of detail. As you'll see, morning Cliff, your favorite stock picks. And this week's focus is I'm going to follow up on Snap Crap. I was doing that every week for a while, and then I decided to back off a little bit because you got the idea. But I thought it'd be a good idea to follow up. And then this week I got to thinking, let's look at some charts at a chart show. What a concept. So let's talk about the state of the markets. This disclaimer, as you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that from Greg Morris. Early in June, I talked about buying IPOs based on a daylight breakout pattern. And a lot of my research comes from proving a point or showing a point or whatever the case may be. But it comes from my educational business. And that's one reason I love the educational business is it forces me to do research. And a lot of times I'll just set out to make a point about something. And before you know it, I'll actually discover something. So I just wanted to show a simple, very, very, very simple, something that had some fairly concrete rules that would keep you out of trouble in IPOs that don't go up. And all I said was that the low of the price bar must be above the five-day moving average. Now, if you go in and watch the presentation that I did earlier in June, where I flesh this out in a lot more detail, the reason I did that five-day was to keep you from buying IPOs within the first week of trading. I do have a pattern that allow you to buy on the close of the fifth day but just to for illustrative purposes i thought okay let's put the moving average in there so you won't have a moving average show up on a chart until after day five and that's why i did that and then the second rule is that you want to buy and to close the first day the stock makes a new closing high unless of course as i've said quite a bit the high was set on the first day of trading so this is what that looks like. And in this particular case, the high was set on the first day of trading, as you can see here. And then your moving average kicks in a week later. And you have daylight here, and you have a new, I'm sorry, this is not a new closing high, but not quite a new closing high, and also not closing above that high of day one. So that's the entire setup. And if you, again, go back and watch the one, the, the video I did earlier in June. So I don't want to redo the whole video on that. And then in this particular case, you had the daylight here. And then the close was not only a new closing high, which would be above here, okay, but also closed above the high that was set on day one, okay. Now, if this high was down here somewhere, then it would only have to be a new closing high. So this would be your high level you'd have to get over. And you buy, it's a buy and a close pattern, which is a little bit different from what I normally do. Most, well, all of my patterns with the exception of what I call the buy at B pattern or setup and this Dave Landry's IPO moving average breakout or whatever we're going to end up calling this pattern. Those are the only two that are actually buy on close. So what you would have to do is you'd have to wait right up until the close to see if it, it looked like it would easily close above those levels before we'll get again. Now, I did do some research, at least on the buy at B, where you could get in on the next open. And in some cases, it worked out pretty good. Sometimes it actually would open lower, but then recover from that. So if you miss that buy and the close, as I have done before, I'll, I'll go in and, and just look to get in on the next open. The only problem with looking to get in on the next open is now you've got a new piece of information. If it opens lower, do you still get in? And it gets kind of complicated quickly. 
Will Rogers once said that you want to buy stocks that go up, and if you don't, if they don't go up, don't buy them. Then obviously he was being facetious. But there is a lot of truth to that when it comes to IPOs, and it's kind of cool. I didn't notice that he was a trend following moron like myself. I thought I was the first trend following moron. So in a case like Snap Crap, it's one of these overhyped IPOs, and you can see that it just went straight down. Now this was the one the reason I keep beating up on Snap Crap was this was where I designed a pattern around it. I wrote a column when Snap Crap was first coming out and said, okay, well, let's just come up with a little system here. And so it would have to have daylight and close at a new closing high. So you do closing high, in this particular case, was set on the day two of the IPO. This would be day one. This would be day two. And the high was not set on day one. The high was set on day two. So we don't have to worry about the new high rule. But the close would have taken out that day one high anyway. So it would actually have to close, based on this pattern, above 26 and change to make it a buy. And as you can see, the performance has been abysmal so far. And if you get a chance, go in on my IPO page and uh, trade IPOs, which I'll give you the link in just one second. And you'll see a, a pretty good video, if I say so myself, on IPOs. It's going to certainly get you started and explain a lot of their characteristics to you. Now, the, way I, the reason I call it snap crap is not that I would confuse the issue with facts, but I have a hard time understanding how snap crap can make money. I understand how Facebook makes money because if you now notice, when you get on Facebook, you get ads. Okay, and I have a friend of mine was complaining a while back about all the ads on Facebook, and I'm like, dude, if you don't know what the product is, it's you. So I guess it's snap crap, the product is you, but I just don't, I don't see it and I don't get it. And maybe at some point it'll become a viable platform, but a way to put googly eyes and puking rainbows and send it to your friends just doesn't seem like a, a viable business model to me. Now, someday it might be. Now, keep in mind, again, you don't want to confuse the issue with facts. Sometimes an IPO might have some sort of promise of the future, and that's why I named my course The Promise of the Future, that even if you don't fully understand it, if the technicals are there, then it might be worth a shot. So speaking of which, IPO is a promise of the future. If you go to this link here, there's about a one hour and change video. And that's going to show you a lot, at least build the base on trading IPOs. Now, eventually, the IPO course will become part of the learning management system. And I've been getting a lot of good feedback on that so far. And I've got the trading full circle courses in there. And by learning management, you have to take the lessons in order, then you have to pass the quizzes on the lessons. And I can go in and see, not that I'm going to be big brother on you, but I can see what you've done and what you haven't. And a lot of people will buy our course, and then they'll ask me a bunch of questions, and I'll think, okay, this person is mentally challenged because I spelled it out carefully for them. And they're like, well, I hadn't had time to watch the course. It's like, aha, so you're not, you're not working at it. you got to work at this, okay? Because if you're not willing to work, a lot of other people will be. So anyway, oh, um, I think the promo code's still good too. So this I left this slide in from June. But if you punch in IPO 200, all lowercase, no spaces, and hit apply, you'll get $200 off the IPO course. And the reason I mentioned the learning management system is IPOs might be the next one that I put into the learning management system, which means that everything will be completely redone. And as you'll see, or if you go in and watch at least the intro videos to the Trading Full Circle, you'll see that it's a lot more high-end than my prior courses have been with the animation and all. And just, it's really, I'm pretty excited about it, as you can tell. Anyway, uh, check that out. And the reason I'm mentioning the learning management system is any course that you purchase, you'll have unlimited lifetime upgrades 
And any time that I redo the course, you will you will get the new improved version. And when I do the IPO course, for instance, I'll add in some of this newer research. All right, so A D D. I left out a D here. We'll have to fix that in editing. <laughs> I woke up this morning thinking, all right, what do I want to talk about? Well, we kind of beat the dead horse on IPOs lately, and then I talked last week and week before a little bit about drawdowns, and we're always talking about psychology. And I'm right now I'm publishing the money management videos and uh, my trading full circle course, which is kind of hard to make money management exciting. That, that's nobody wants to hear about money management, although it's important. So I just got to think, what can we talk about? Well, let's just talk about charts at a chart show. And it's been a while since we've I've done one of these state of the markets address. So let's do that and take a look at what's working, what's not, and where we should be looking for opportunities, if any. Well, let's first start off with the NASDAQ. Now, this is the 50-day moving average. And one thing that's kind of cool about the 50 is the concept of daylight can work quite well. And you can see that this very long trend in here, you only had a few days where you didn't have daylight. Daylight meaning that if you were to shine a flashlight or hold this up to the sun, you could see daylight or light between the low and the moving average. Now, I only plot the 50-day moving average on a chart especially the indices or the individual sectors, when the market might be at a bit of an inflection point. I like to see where the 50 is because it's a good point of reference. And as I've said before, for longer term moving averages like anything 20 or above, I usually like an exponential moving average. But I do like to plot the 50 every now and then because it is well watched. And it is kind of interesting the way it behaves. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting about the 50-day moving average or any other technical analysis, or a lot of technical analysis, I should say, nothing except for the arcane stuff. Let's just throw that out right away. But one thing interesting about technicals is a lot of technicals come together at the same point. And that's why at, a, at, at some point, if you're using a whole bunch of technical indicators it'll all start to look the same anyway and that's one reason i'm not a huge fan of using a lot of indicators amongst others such as lag but we often joke or i used to often joke years ago when i was working with another trader when we were doing our analysis together it's like somehow the moving average knows where the support is it's like how do it no it's, it reminds me of the old thermos joke uh, the old Cajun thermos joke, you know, Boudreaux puts his his hot soup in the thermos and it keeps it hot. He puts his, his cold drink in the thermos and it keeps it cold. It's like, how do it know? It keeps the hot things hot, the cold things cold. So the a lot of technicals are kind of like the thermos. How do it know? And in this particular case, we have the recent low in here, this little knockout bar. And go in and watch last week's presentation because we talked about this trend knockout here, took off, and then the market stopped out. But it made another knockout bar. So this is our inflection point right here, these lows. And then lo and behold, the, moon, the moving average, the 50-day moving average is also right there. So it can provide an inflection point, And a lot of times it's also right where some other technicals are coming together. Recent low support, top of a recent base, etc. I mean, if you go back and look at this base here, I'm just kind of looking at it as we speak, and you can see that the moving average was right at that base, so that would have been a support level. So nothing magical about it, but it's something that you might want to take a look at. Now, the example we used with the trend knockout was in the queues. This was the knockout bar here. The entry was above the high. And then it rallied pretty nicely, stopped out. And then he had another knockout here. And then once again, your 50-day moving average, no big shocker, is right at those prior lows. So not a line in the sand in the NASDAQ or the Qs, but if we do take out these levels, you might want to pull your horns in a little bit. Let's take a look at the Ps. And I had the 50 plotted for you here. 
And look at where the 50-day moving average is. It's right at this 2,400 level. Well, what's 2,400? 2,400 is the top of the prior range. So again, how do we know? <laughs> so we need to watch that level. Again, not a line in the sand, but we need to watch to see if it gets retested. Now, one thing about the peas is they're just kind of chopping around in here. And you know me, I sure would like to see them accelerate higher and not look back for a while. But so far, we do have some daylight here still above the moving average. So again, how do it know? Now, let's take a look at the Russell 2000. And one thing good about the Russell 2000, at least on a short-term level, it is above the 50-day moving average. But unfortunately, it's stuck in the range. And then, again, nothing magical about a moving average, but you can see that what happened here, the moving average went flat. Well, that should wake you up to the fact that the Russell has gone flat for a long, long time. Now, the Russell might be indicate, indicative, uh, indicative, I should say, indicative, indicator, indicative, indicative, indicative of what we've been seeing internally with trying to catch some of these trends in some of these high beta stocks and some of these momentum stocks. And the Russell has been pretty choppy in here. It's like we, we catch a trend, it begins to get, get moving nicely, and all of a sudden it comes back in. So it's been a little frustrating. And quite a, just quite frankly, the buy and hold actually crowd has actually looked a little smarter this year. But I think that's getting ready to change. And as we go through these charts, I think you'll begin to see what I mean. Now, banks have been dying forever. And if you take a look at them, they made this complex head and shoulder pattern. Now, I don't trade directly off of classical technical analysis, but I would encourage you to read, and I'm looking at my bookcase here to see if I can find you a few books to read. Read um, John Murphy's books on technical analysis. Read Edwards and McGee, of course. Read Schaubacher. Go back and read anything you can find from him to learn about technical analysis. And then uh, I have a book from Gann here. Throw out all those Gann lines. Throw out all that arcane crap from Gann. Okay. And but the first, it, 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 the book is, if I could read the title, How to Make Profits in Commodities. It's the what a lot of people refer to as the Orange Book. The first 30, 40 pages is more of a psychology uh, type of, of technical, psychology technical analysis type of uh, thing. And I would encourage you to read that. I actually got heckled in Russia <laughs> because some guy says, uh, asked, he says, uh, he asked me about GAN. I'm like, I don't get GAN. He's like, well, you have an MBA and a computer science degree. How do you, how, how do you not get GAN? I was like, oh, shit. Gan died broke, okay? So I wouldn't get into all the arcane Gan stuff. I would just I'd run away from that. You know, by the way, if you draw enough lines on the chart, and, and I forget who said this first, but if you draw enough lines on the chart, sooner or later, it's going to be at one of them. It's kind of like some of these, not all Fibonacci people, because I don't want to throw the Fibonacci people under the bus, but some of these Fibonacci people out there will put like 50 Fibonacci lines on a chart and it's like, ah, you see it reverse right at Fibonacci. But yeah, you got 50 lines on the chart. But anyway, I don't mean to, to digress so far, but the, the first 20 or 30 pages of that game, but maybe 50 pages, I forget exactly how much, it does have a little bit of a psychology or technical analysis type of, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And if somebody wants to tell me, don't listen to what Gant's trying to tell you directly. It's kind of indirectly what he's saying. It makes a lot of sense. So anyway, I don't mean to go off on that tangent. Uh, Pring has a lot of good introduction to technical analysis type of things and classical technical analysis things, but focus mostly on the classics such as Schaubacher and Edwards and McGee. And what I like to do is once I identify some sort of head and shoulders pattern or double top, double bottom, whatever the case may be, maybe look for one of my setups inside of that pattern. So. For instance, a gatekeeper sell signal will usually set up within a head and shoulder pattern. And in fact, we need to keep an eye out for that. And I'll show you in a couple of charts here why we need to worry about that. A bow tie will often set up in a head and shoulders type of pattern. 
So a head and shoulders is just simply, you have a shoulder, you have a head, and then you have another head. And then in an ideal world, this head is higher, I'm sorry, this shoulder is higher than this one. And it's just a topic formation. Now, I wouldn't, you don't rush out and trade these, but pay attention to when they occur. It looks like we're having a complex one, meaning many shoulders, and in this particular case, just one head. But you could have multiple heads, too. You could have a double top in here if this was a little higher. So that's what I mean by complex. Now, we take a look at hardware, also known as Apple. If you plot Apple, which we can plot in a little while if you guys want to take a look at that. It looks a lot like hardware itself just because it's such a big company. And you can see that we had this range and we broke out of the range, came back in, mirrored a little bit, and now we're trying to break down. Now, just as a general statement, when you have a market in a range and it breaks out of the range, if you look to play the other side, that will actually test out. Okay, I wouldn't run out and trade the pattern. And this is what it would look like to the downside. Let's say you get a market in range, breaks out, and then play the breakdown. So we could be in this shakeout type of pattern where it sucks people in and then it shakes them out on the other side. It sucks them in and spits them out. So that's hardware. Now, let's take a look at the energies. Now, this is the danger of trading value. And you can see that energies were in pretty serious downtrend. And then just yesterday and the day before, they began to bang out new lows with vigor. So you don't want to rush in and try to catch that falling knife. As I often say, it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. Now, if we take a look at metals and mining, I would say a big ditto for that. I'll let the software catch up for a second so you can see the chart. But as you can see, as a general statement, metals and mining have been headed lower for a long, long time. So you don't want to rush out and buy them. Let them bottom out and let them form some sort of uh, transitional pattern before considering. Now, if you take a look at retail, we bow tied down here. Now, this is what I call a forced bow tie because the market, it sort of gradually rolled over, but then it sold off hard. And that forces that bow tie to form. And obviously, this is part of the whole paycheck buyout. Amazon, as you know, unless you've been sleeping on a rock, even I know, because I, even by not following news, I still know, Amazon bought out whole paycheck. So it doesn't matter why retail is going down. As I often say, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. So retail is in trouble. Now, if you take a look at the semis, and once again, I threw the 50-day moving average in there. And if you look at the recent lows in here from this knockout move that we had, this little knockout pullback, whatever you want to call it, once again, it's close to the 50-day moving average, close enough for government work. So, again, not a line in the sand, but an area we want to want to watch. So it could be another thermos type of situation. Now the trannies have recently broken out. My only concern here is they're in this drifting mode. In markets, I like to see them go up, pull back, go up, pull back, rinse and repeat. You don't want to see a market go up and then have an upward drift to it. You want it to look more like this. And to those who are familiar with the aforementioned technical analysis, classical technical analysis, this would be called a flag because it looks like a flag, okay? This is actually bullish. This, even though markets make a new highs, is bearish. Now, I wouldn't rush out and say, let's short the trannies, but I sure would like to see some acceleration out of this drifting pattern before getting too excited there. Now, biotech has been doing really well. Now, this is, a, this is what I would call a very solid breakout. As you can see, it was in a range for quite a while, but now it's beginning to break out with some vigor. So I would keep an eye out for setups in biotech. Health services has also been doing fairly well in here. 
as you can see. And then insurance is not setting the world on fire, but it looks okay. You can see it recently broke out. It's pulling back a little bit in here. Now, some of these brick and mortar areas are waking up again. And that's been one of the interesting things about the market. You've had these lower beta brick and mortar areas chop it around, but generally working their way higher. And this has actually helped the indices to move higher so far in 2017. But you can see so far it's working its way higher, pulling back a little bit, nearly to where it broke out from. But so far, still in an uptrend, so far just pulling back. Material construction, another one of those brick and mortar literally areas. But you can see it's pulled almost all the way back to its breakout. So very important to see some follow through here soon. Now, a couple things. It's getting a little mixed out there, obviously. We've got some areas that have been in downtrends for a while. We've got some areas at inflection points, and then we have a few areas, not too many. We need to take a look at financials, too. I forgot to put the financials chart in. I wanted to put the XLF in. We'll take a look at that, and we'll get the live charts. But it is getting a little mixed out there. Again, metals and mining headed lower. Energy's headed lower. The semis mostly headed higher, but at a bit of inflection point. The NASDAQ itself mostly headed higher, a bit of inflection point. Hardware beginning to fail. So it's getting mixed. Sell in May, you might be thinking, well, as I wrote, I think last May or May before May, May before last, it's actually more sell in June, which is Tom McClellan's speech that he did on that a few years back, the American Association of Professional Technical Analyst meetings, meeting. And the reason he said, the reason selling may caught on is that things that or that rhyme, or I forget the exact statistics, but it's, it's, it's greater than 70%, nearly 80%, I believe. It doesn't matter. Statistics are worthless. 75% of all people know that. But I think it's like a 70 to 80% more believable if it rhymes, and then his example he gave was, if the glove doesn't, doesn't fit, you must acquit. And we all know how that turned out. And Tom's research went on to say that it's actually more of a sell in June type of thing. Now, when it comes to market analysis and research, I always ask myself, is this academic? In other words, can I actually trade off of it? And even if you did come up with an edge that you're better off selling in June, then there's a few things, a few problems I have with that. First of all, you don't really have a valid statistical sample because that's a yearly signal. That's a seasonal signal. And if you are trading a seasonal, then a seasonal could not work for several years and still be statistically valid. So that's one problem with the seasonal type of pattern. The other thing that's kind of interesting is sometimes your contra-seasonal moves can be phenomenal. For those of you who trade commodities, when you get that contra-seasonal, when the grain should be going down, they start going up, something's wrong. So you would miss tremendous opportunities there. For the stock picker, if a great stock comes along, even though it's summer, even though summers suck, usually, to put it mildly, if you don't take the setup, you miss that elusive outlier that's important for your longer-term success. But the point I'm making here is just be careful with these Wall Street adages. And as I wrote, I wrote the column a couple years ago. I was looking at it this morning. And a couple of years ago, my performance was abysmal during the summer. And somebody at the end of the summer told me, well, everybody knows, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. <laughs> I haven't seen a commercial in a while. I see potential in you and you. And, uh oh <laughs> Everyone knows that you just sell in May and go away. It's like, well... That's true, but if you go in and look, you could see that 
by doing that, you would have missed a lot of great outliers over the years, which would have made a made a broke your year, or certainly made a huge impact in your performance. So be careful of those Wall Street adages. Nothing you can you can't really box things up into a little package. Uh, mechanical research, for in, instance, and I've done probably more than anyone out there. I haven't done much lately, but years ago I spent a lot of time testing mechanical systems. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it does, you do learn a lot in the process. But unfortunately, markets aren't normally distributed. So those statistics don't always continue forward. And if they did, you'd own the world. Think about that. And as I often say, a casino has a very tiny edge, specifically on board games. But somehow, casinos are a multi-trillion dollar industry. And that's because that edge over time is a true edge. Your edge in the market is never going to be a true, at least statistical edge. I know that trading with the trend is the way to go. I know the only way to make money in the market, obviously, is a capture trend. But I can't guarantee you what your percent returns are going to be. If I could, if I could come up with an edge in the market, even if it was a half a percent, and I was guaranteed that half a percent edge, I would be just like the casinos. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist. So again, the whole point there, be careful of the Wall Street adages. Now, we need to keep an eye out on these sectors to make sure more don't join into the fray, more sectors that are dubious, that is don't join into the fray, or become dubious, I should say. So it's getting a little mixed out there, but the good thing is I am seeing some momentum return, specifically in areas like biotech. So that's certainly a good thing. And it's always a stock picker's market as far as I'm concerned, but we could get back into a stock picker's market. I think if I had to... If I had to make a general statement, I probably do better, even though I like the market to go up, and it is important for the market to go up, and I always preach trend, trend, trend. But as far as my stock picking abilities, my ability to beat the market is usually much better when the market is not in a, in a solid trend or certainly, let me kind of rephrase that. My ability to, make, to beat the market is, is usually when the market is mostly sideways, because I'll, I'll be out of market, so I'll beat on, on a on a relative basis. But even on a, I mean, even on an absolute basis, usually you could find a few stocks that are worth trading. Now, what's difficult is when a market is kind of all over the place, but eventually works its way higher. Sometimes that type of market is hard to beat because I'm short here, and they can take it out, and the market goes higher. And sometimes when a market is just working its way higher. But doing so due to vicious sector rotation, as we've seen on and off throughout this year, it's hard to beat with the stock picking. But now I think we could be getting back into the stock picking market as the market becomes a little bit more choppier. So hopefully that makes sense. I guess the, the bottom line, or to rephrase this, is that sometimes buy and hold rewards the buy and hold crowd and makes you question stock picking. Stock picking will win in the end, but it doesn't always win. All right, once again, it's here. The Trading Full Circle course is now live. And if you go to this link, you can start watching the videos for free. All right, I think I've covered everything as far as announcements. The only thing that I haven't announced is that I think the next the next two weeks I'm going to take off from the, the weekend chart. So if you're looking for me, I'll be taking off for a couple of weeks. I need to catch up on some of these projects. 
that I've been working on. It seems like everybody's on vacation anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but next couple of weeks, no week in charts. So we'll pick up uh, the week, uh, week after, two weeks after July. I forget which date that is. July 4th. All right, let's go to live charts. If you guys want to ask, the only thing I forgot to mention is when we ask about as many stocks as you want, just ask about one stock and hit return. And that way I know what I've talked about and what I haven't. So let me get the chart set up here. Uh, we need to take a look at the financials, and then I'll be happy to look at any individual stocks that you want to look at. So let's take a look at that XLF. Now, the reason I wanted to use that XLF, and I didn't put the – Morning store, uh, Morning Star Industry Group in there is because of the Morning Star Industry Group has a lot of. I'm sorry, I'm, I had to multi process for a second. The Morning Star Industry Group has a lot of ETFs, and I'll show you that in one second for financials, that is. Okay, so financials are a little dubious, as you can see. They kind of look like a big picture top. And you can call it a head and show it if you want. We'll take a look at a weekly. But at the least, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's gone sideways at best. So let's take a look at a weekly here. Yeah, on a weekly basis, it does have a little bit more head and shoulder look to it. Doesn't mean you want to rush out and short the financials just yet, okay? But it is important for them to get past their recent highs. And oh, as far as the, uh, let me just show you something. Let's take a look at the SMH. Maybe that might be a good, uh, good example for the semis. As I said earlier, we want to keep an eye out to make sure we don't have these gatekeeper patterns. Now, gatekeeper, usually I like to see a little bit deeper pullback or, or sell-off, but it's kind of in the, in the spirit of the pattern. If it does, these markets that have, have sharp sell-offs, like the NASDAQ itself, if they stall short of the prior highs, then that's a bit of a gatekeeper type of pattern. That's the closest to a reversal pattern that I'll trade, so we need to pay attention to that. So again, the bottom line of the sector says they are mixed. Okay, Donna wants to know about Goose. We are long Goose. It triggered a little while ago, uh, mechanically at least. When uh, this is actually a good teaching example here, if I can make the chart work. Sometimes it's hard with an IPO. Okay, uh, we had an entry like at twenty-two and a half. I hate when we. I hate when you have a stock. And might be able to draw this better with a. Let's see if we can draw it on this. I hate when you have an entry and it comes really close to triggering. Of course, I know people don't pay attention to my entries anyway. They just front run everything. But sometimes you can front run and do well, and sometimes I would recommend you don't front run. Now, I can't front run. So let's say you have an entry right here. And then the next day the stock comes like really close, but doesn't quite get there. A lot of times on the following day you'll have a gap higher and it'll come back in. So in these particular cases, I like to apply a little discretion and suggest that you get in above the intraday high if it does make an opening gap reversal, as opposed to just jumping into the mechanical entry. So we have a bit of that situation going on today, as you can see in Goose. But I like Goose a lot, okay, obviously. So, yeah, I'll give you a high five. It's the best-looking stock in Stocktown. I think it looks fantastic. It's IPO. It's got everything going for it, okay. Massive breakout, nice deep pullback. Looks like it wants to snap back and go to old highs, it go to its old highs, make some new highs. So good eye, Donald. First high five of the day. Way to start out, straight out the gate, a high five. I don't think that's ever happened in the history of Dave Landry's The Week of Charts. M-Y-O? M-Y-O is not coming up. M-Y-O. Oh, there it is. Um, 
Well, this is a little too extreme. Okay. I mean, if you if you have guts, you might be able to trade something like this. Let's put a moving average in. See what it looks like. Okay, that's not really that telling. Um, maybe on a little bit deeper pullback, I would see it as a first deep retracement slash first pullback. But I think it's a little too dangerous because it it doubled straight out of the gate, more than doubled, nearly tripled. So that's a little too crazy. I think I'd leave that alone. Okay, Thomas wants to know about what do you mean by front runner and entry? Well, every now and then, and now's not the time to be doing this. And this type of, this is not the market to do this. I don't know why I can't erase. By front runner and entry, Let's say you've got a pullback. And you decide you're going to enter right here, okay? And you're looking at the market, and things are looking pretty good. And you decide, well, I'm going to get in a little early. I'm going to get in right here. Because when it takes out this high, the whole world's going to see it. And that's going to help push my position higher. So I'm going to get in a little early. As a general statement, I would urge you not to front run setups. If we get into a 1999 situation, like in, in, if anybody remembers 1999, then that's a great time to actually front run the setup. Get in a little bit early. So let's maybe like a TKO might be a good example. So let's say you have a TKO type of bar, like looks like this you might look to get in right here because it's already come all the way back to here. And then everybody else is going to trigger when it takes out that high. Again, though, unless the market is is going crazy, straight up or whatever, I would not front run any. Should I bought Goose today if I use discretion, my buying entry? Um, yeah, let's take a look at that. This is not a perfect cut and dry example. Um, I was hoping that if it did reverse, this open would be would be a little more obvious. But yeah, it didn't really go that much above the open. So either way, but it did technically see it opened, but then it actually took out that opening range. So technically, it's not an obvious discretionary call, but the fact that it, it only got another quarter point in there. You could sit on your hands and wait for that to re-trigger above today's high. So let's take a look at the intraday chart. So when you do have these situations, you have to make a determination on, on where you're going to get in. That's not really obvious in the five-minute chart. Let's see. Yeah, you did have a gap. Let's see if we can clean this chart up a little bit. Talk amongst yourselves. Here we go. Yeah, it's not it's not completely obvious. Because it gapped, oh here it is. It gapped open here. And technically it did take out. It did take out the top of the gap. Here we go, right here. Okay, before it came back in. So either way is okay. Um but you can give it a little wiggle room to see how it opens up and see if it follows through. It just takes a little bit more discipline. You have to say, well, I'm going to get in no matter what at a certain level as opposed to sitting there like a deer in the headlights. Anytime you add a level of discretion to a trade, you have to be really careful. But I think it looks fantastic. I think it still has uh, major potential in here. Mule. Mule has come all the way back in. That's the only problem I have with Mule is this is one I was watching for a while. And it broke out, but then it came all the way back in. So in a case like this, I would let it make new highs. I mean, IPOs do have a bit of a breakout characteristic where you can play the breakouts. 
But I would make let him make new highs and then play pullbacks along the way. Okay, my only problem with this one is PBYI, Puma, is the the breakout here went straight it just went straight up for a couple of days. And that's like a what? A hundred percent move, as you can see, like a hundred percent move. It's just such an extreme move over such a short period of time. It's going to be hard for that to be sustainable. And then you have quite a few days here in the pullback. So I would pass on that, and I would just keep an eye out on other biotechs that are breaking out now or trending now, and then look for TKO type of patterns and things like that. So I would hold off on that one. Feel, at least for now it's just too extreme and when it shoot up like this usually they have a big correction down and they're really hard to play okay any more questions cvna yeah here's another case where it's just kind of an extreme move now this is where some of those ipo breakout characteristics coming to play. In fact, what's pretty cool here is notice the high was set on the first day of trading. So the stock should be left alone until what? It takes out that high. Let's put the moving average in. Okay. And with a five-day moving average using the setup we talked about earlier, then where would your entry be? Well, it would have to close above the high of this day because Again, the high was set on the first day of trading. So your closing high, if you were just looking at a closing high, your buy would have been on this day, okay? But because of that rule, it would actually have to close above this high. Let's zoom in a little bit, and let's see if that actually touched the moving average. It could have maybe could have actually been a buy on that day. Let's see. We talked about this one last week. Low was 12.13. No. So technically, your buy was on this day here, okay? And let me clean the chart up. Two things have to happen. Number one, daylight, check. Number two, close at a new closing high. And if the high, the all-time high was set on day one, then it also has to close above that, and it did. So that would have been the buy. Phil says, I have CVNA from 11. Ah, well, let's see what Phil did. Cool. Nice job, Phil. Yeah, when you get into these IPOs on a pioneer pattern, the reason I call them pioneer patterns, it's the first chance to get on. You're getting in early. You're a pioneer. And like the American pioneers, one or two things are going to happen. You're either going to get the arrows in your back or you're going to get the gold. So sometimes it can work out really nicely. Now, on this particular stock, you need to wait for the next maybe a TKO type of move or a pullback, but a TKO would be pretty nice. You're welcome, Steve. Steve wants to talk about ENZ. Uh, looks good. It's making new highs. It's in the right sector. The only thing that's kind of jumping out at me a little tiny bit, and it's a little thin, but not too thin, but what's jumping out at me is it's kind of drifting in here, okay? It broke out decisively, but now it's begun to drift higher. So I would actually almost like to see a little acceleration higher and then for it to pull back. So if we go through biotech, we could probably, what's his health services, but I guess it's considered, it says biochem. Is that a biotech? Um, if we go to this, let's just go to this sub-industry to see what we got. This is one I've been watching for what it's worth. CO, China Cord. Let's see if we can find something else that's kind of interesting in here for you. So you want something that looks like this, it's kind of headed higher and then pulls back. Let's see what else is in here. 
And we'll take a look at the biotechs if we have time. See, like that one's beginning to accelerate higher, so maybe on a pullback. But it looks okay. I It looks okay, all right? But it really hasn't taken out this high here just yet. So I'd like to see actually a little bit more acceleration. Do put this one, ENZ that is, on your momentum list. But I'd like to see some little, a little bit more momentum there. This one right here, where is it? There it is. You can see how this one's beginning to accelerate higher a little bit. So that has a little bit more momentum to it, and it's in a longer-term trend. So make sure that's on your momentum list too. BHVN, that's one I was looking at a while back. It's making, it made new highs, but it really didn't take out this high here. So put it on your momentum list, and let's just, let's check back and see how it sets up. Ideally, since it didn't really take out this prior high here, I'd like to see it go a little higher, maybe 30-ish or something, and then have some sort of knockout type of bar. I'm a little bit more lenient, as you know, with IPOs. Jim wants to talk about Hoss. It's Hornback. My problem with the energies is this. And as we looked at them earlier, we can find them real quick. It's the, as I said earlier, it's the always darkest right before it gets more dark problem. What's up, man? I thought it would come right up. I guess it could have just jumped through the energies. Oh, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. Long run for a short slide, huh? <laughs> so, again, it's the danger of value, okay? So let's take a look at Haas, which is horned back offshore. I've met Todd before. He's a nice guy. He's the CEO. Unfortunately, though, it's not quite set up. So it could form a bow tie. Now, it is going to hit a little resistance around 6.5. Now, I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth for a second. With a transitional pattern, you might be fighting the overall trend. You will be fighting the overall trend in a lot of cases, especially in the underlying sector. So you have to take them on a case-by-case -case basis. So if Haas bow ties and then pulls back a little bit, it might be worth a shot, but you will have some resistance to deal with here and some resistance to deal with here. So I would pass on this one. And the reason I wanted to bring up that transitional pattern is because you might see me mention some of these stocks in the near future, such as Hornback or whatever the case may be. And I don't want to look like I'm not practicing what I preach. So sometimes you will get a transitional pattern. Haas shows up as a shipper in my software. Well, I happen to know the company. Um, it's they, they service the oil field companies, okay? I just happen to know that. Now, that's, that's a tricky thing. Sometimes... Sometimes you have to look up a company to make sure it's in the right category. For instance, and I can never remember the name of the company, but years ago there was a company, they might still exist, it might be CCMP. It was a chemical company, but the chemicals they made were made to wash PCB boards, in other words, semiconductor boards. 
So it traded a lot more like a semiconductor than it did a chemical. So the chemicals were all headed lower, but this stock was headed higher because the semis were headed higher. So uh, in this particular case, I would view Hornback as an oil equipment and service stock as it's listed here. But yeah, Haas is mostly oil field related. What's the, uh, is it OIH, oil services? See, here's your oil service vectors. And you can see they just look absolutely abysmal. I heard Tidewater went out of business. See, Tidewater might be listed as a shipping company. We'll come back to that one. Yeah, see, Tidewater is listed as a shipping company. That's case in point. But Tidewater makes the boats, or not makes the boats, uh, owns the boats that goes out to the rigs. They're a supply company. Okay, and they're actually just recently filed Chapter 11. Be one hell of a Phoenix stock, though, huh? Wouldn't that be crazy when that began to take off? Take off. But yeah, these OIH not looking so good. But maybe when it comes down here and bottoms out, you know, I'm 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 hoping for the mother of all bottoms, and I'm not in a hurry. In oil, in the oil stocks, and in and the gold stocks, for that matter, and other metals too. I'd like to see them go down and just hit all-time lows and look absolutely abysmal for a while and then make the mother of all bow ties and then we ride them all the way back up for a phoenix type of trade right so this oih maybe come down here to the teens bottom out for a long time and then return to 55 that'd be beautiful yeah donald cam t was in the trading service it's it's just too long in the pullback kind of a crazy stock but I like I did like the fact that it made like a TKO type of move, and it kind of did like a a back to back TKO, which gave you this deep pullback. This one bar wasn't quite enough, based on the magnitude of this move. So you had this second bar here. I mean, this is borderline too crazy even for Big Dave, right? But yeah, now it's too many days in the pullback. Here's the thing with a TKO, and I've said this before, but let me just. For those of you who might be new to the pattern. In fact, let's see if we could find the NASDAQ. Might be a good example. Yeah, there's a cues. With a TKO, it doesn't erase anymore. Anybody know how to erase? I used to be able to hit the E key. I don't know how to, well, let's just do, let's just do a black screen. Well, with a TKO type of pattern, you really want it to catch people off guard. So say you had a really nice trend, and you want to get shorts sucked in and nervous Nelly longs knocked out, and even longer term longs that might be in trend following mode, you want those guys to get knocked out too. And then in an ideal world, you want to see this market turn right back around and go straight back up. And the reason is the longs that got knocked out will have to put up or shut up. In other words, get back in or risk being left behind. And the shorts that just got triggered in are going to get squeezed. And shorts tend to confuse the issue with facts. They tend to be a little more egotistical. So they might even wait for the market to be way up here before they start covering. And that... That's why sometimes you get a TKO like this, and then all of a sudden the market goes parabolic because these Johnny Come Lately's rush back in at new highs, and then the shorts rush to cover at new highs, and then the market goes parabolic. Now, eventually it exhausts itself, and I know that there are shorts out there that like to short the parabolics, which I think is a really bad idea. <laughs> really, really bad idea. But it's a very egotistical type of thing to do. So, yeah, Donald, you answered your own question. Too many days of the pullback. I'm a little bit more. Now, if, if, a, if a stock, if it's an IPO or something, and it had a really massive move higher and, and made a bunch of small bars, like if all these small bars here were like up here and it just kind of drifted lower, then had a TKO move, then I'd be more excited about it. But now, since you've had the knockout move and now it's just kind of meandering in here, 
I would leave it alone. Keep it on your momentum list, though, just for SOGs, but I think I'd leave it alone. All right, any more questions? All right, going once. Going twice. All right, well, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. As you can tell, I have fun doing these shows. It's a highlight of my week. Uh, no shows for the next two weeks. Um, check the schedule on the website. I'll, I'll, I'll update that and put the countdown, fix the countdown uh, shortly after this show. But uh, no shows next two weeks. Everybody enjoy your 4th of July. If I don't see you or talk with you between now and then. And everybody enjoy your weekend if we don't talk between now and then. Thank you so much. And hope to see you guys in a couple of weeks. Thank you.